Okay, I'm not used to using a microphone because I'm pretty loud, but I've been told I need to for taping purposes. So I'm going to have to manage my notes, the microphone, the computer. This could be really interesting. And we only have 50 minutes to do what we should probably be taking about three hours to do. So I'm going to cram as much as I can in here. But the most important thing that you will leave with at the end is my contact information. So that if you need help writing a grant, finding a grant, you want to know more about what we do at the place I work, which I'll tell you about in a minute, then you'll know how to contact me. Okay? So if you decide now that you want to go to sleep because you just had lunch, you know that you'll get it at the very end. And I'll ding a bell at about quarter after two when you can all wake up, and you'll get that. Okay? Um, my name's Janine Yard. That's, that's my name right there. I'm a, a <laughs> right there. Uh, I'm a program officer at the Michigan Community Service Commission. Has anybody heard of our place? I got. I saw one hand, two hands. Ooh, wow! This is exciting. <laughs> um, I left. I also left at your tables. Um, some people call them slick sheets that has information about our organization, and we'll talk briefly about that. But what I'm really here today to talk about is navigating the RFP process. Um, so tell me, before I get started, because I know what I'm here, what I was going to present, but tell me what you want to get out of this workshop. Why did, why did you come here? Because you only had two choices? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you got to go to both of them? Or <laughs> is there really something that you want to learn based on the description? If you don't want to learn anything, that's good, because you'll just get what I give you. Okay. Okay. Good, good. So it'll expand your horizons. And you might decide that after you listen to this that there's opportunities and you just want to spread out there and write your own grant. Do you know, women, there are grants out there just for women to further your causes. I mean, if you want a grant to go back to school, if you want a grant to start a business, you know, there's all kinds of new grant opportunities out there, some small, some big. Um, some really easy to write for, and, you know, what the heck? You could write a grant and get yourself some money. I, I feel like that guy with all the question marks on his suit that, you know, stands in front of the White House or the Capitol and says, you know, the m money's easy to get. It's not as easy as, as he said, but there are lots of opportunities out there that people don't know about. Anybody else? Specifics? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's good. So finding out about things that might be easier to, you know, the process might be a little easier and it might be a little more manageable for you. Unlike the grants that I administer, which are state AmeriCorps grants, and they're, um, they're wonderful, but it takes a lot of capacity to be able to manage those. Other ideas? Things that you want? Just yell them out. Okay. Anything else? Okay. We're gonna, I'm going to actually show you some places to go, but unfortunately, there isn't a one-size-fits-all, you know, go here and then it takes you to everything else. Um, one of the biggest things that I can explain to you about grant writing is that you don't just jump into it, that you have to do a lot of research up front. And once you do the research, it's going to lay out things for you that you'll want to follow up on and then that you'll want to do. So... So what we're going to cover in the next 
45 minutes or so are a combination of things. I'm going to explain to you some of the lingo. Okay, I'm going to give you some places where you can research grants, the places that I think are the easiest to maneuver. I'm going to share with you a couple of sites that are really great in terms of um, going to them and they provide tutorials on how to actually write a grant. They walk you step by step through how to do it because what we're going to cover today, I'll give you some tips, but it's not the same as being able to go back and have it right there and then practice it. Okay, we're going to do a little bit of practice, but it's going to be real short. Um, I'm going to share with you the main reasons grants get rejected. Okay, a lot of times people give you tips for how to do things, but they don't tell you what funders don't want to fund. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about priorities, um, so, so this is a good one. Um, I'll make sure that we talk about, when I share some of the sites, I'll make sure that I point out the ones that are really appropriate for nonprofits. Um, and I'm going to give you some tips if you're a small nonprofit on how to maneuver, okay? Um, the other thing that was in the title of this workshop was civic engagement. So I want to make sure that when you leave that you also have access to some resources around civic engagement. So that if that's what you want to write a grant for, that you'll also have some places you can go to help back up what it is that you're going to talk about. Okay, um, And I do want to make sure that you know a little bit about where I work so that um, if you need resources in the future that you have a place in Michigan that you can turn to. Okay, So let's see if I can do this from, there's no remote. So um, oh, before, we, before we actually talk about some of these acronyms, let, let's do a little activity since you uh, just got done with lunch and sitting a lot, okay? So I'm going to ask, I'm going to take a poll. And you don't have to speak, you just have to stand up and sit down. You okay with that? Okay, so if you've ever written a grant, please stand up. Okay, for those of you who are standing, if you have written two grants or more, stay standing. If you, okay, if you have written more than five grants, stay standing. If you have written more than 10 grants, ooh, we have an expert. You're going to be tough to share anything new with. <laughs> Tell us where you're from. Uh, I work with the oh, you're a, new, you're a new fundee, a new grantee of mine. Did you know that? Yes. 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 Yay! Yes, you got the grant. You got the grant. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Wonderful. Yay, I'm so excited. I love to do that. But you got funding. Yay! That's, people say, what do you do? And I think, okay, it's really kind of hard to explain. So I just say, I give out money. It's the best job in the entire world. Okay, so for those of you who have, have written grants for a long time, some of this right at the very beginning is going to sound pretty simple. But if you've never written a grant, I thought it's really important to start out with some of the acronyms so that when you see people talk about this stuff in grant, the grant world all the time. And they'll say, um, we have an RFP available. And people will say, well, what the heck is an RFP? Okay, when funders have money, they put out something that says, we want you to write an application. We want you to send us a proposal. An RFP is a request for proposals. So at the organization that I work at, at the commission, we will send out an RFP. We'll put it on our website. We'll mail it out to everybody and their brother and say, we've got money and we want you to apply for it. Okay, that's what an RFP is. The other thing it's sometimes referred to as an RFA, a request for applications. I don't know what the difference is. Some people like A, some people like P, I guess. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's what they look at. Um, the other thing is that these things then are preceded by something. One is called a NOFA, or it's called a NOFO. And it, again, people who 
give money, just throw those out there like you know what they are. But a NOFA just is a notice of funds available. And if you go on websites, this is important to know because when people have those things, a lot of times they don't spell it out. So you'll go to a website and I'll just have a hot link that says NOFA. And you're like, I don't know what that is. So you go past it. If you see that hot link, click on it because that means they've got money. Okay? <laughs> Might not be money you want, but they've got money, okay? And so it's either funds available or funding opportunity. That's the O, okay? So those, those are kind of key things. If you see those acronyms on anybody's website, they don't define it. They've probably done a bad job. You can go to my website, and if we don't have it, you can call me and say, you didn't put that there. So where do you start? That's what we're going to talk about first. Where do you start to look? Okay. The first thing you need to do is to look within your own organization. If, if you're not an extremely small nonprofit, okay, and this is, if you're very, very small, this might not be the best place to start because you might know everybody in your organization and know that nobody there knows anything about funding, so you don't want to talk to them. But sometimes within your own organization, there's somebody there that knows of a funding opportunity has a relationship with somebody who has money, okay? And that might be the very first place to talk to somebody. Um, so it's the, the secret to writing good grants these days is being able to stay connected. Um, it's, it's about relationships. It goes back to that. So, and that doesn't mean that you have to know people who are inside funding agencies. It doesn't mean you need to know the CEO of the Kellogg Foundation. It just means that if you're connected to other people, the more connections that you have, the chances are greater that you're going to find somebody that knows something about funding and where it is. Um, if you're kind of connected to social media, LinkedIn is a really good um, place to be. And a lot of people think, well, you know, what's the benefit of that? Um, I stay on LinkedIn, and I'm connected to probably 150 professional people because when opportunities come up, that's a place for me to find that. And if it doesn't automatically pop up, those are people I will go to to say, do you know anything? So if, somebody, if one of you came to me and said, okay, we have a really small nonprofit agency, and we really need a grant to help us with operational costs, okay? Not too many grants to do that, but we really need that. So I'm, if I'm going to look for you to help you, LinkedIn's one of the first places I'm going to go to, and I'm going to go to the people that I know. So I will go directly to the CEO of the Michigan Nonprofit Association and say, okay, I just met somebody that really need help with this. Who are your resources? Okay, so it's good to know, good to know people. Um, you need to have more than a good idea, too. You need to know what's possible and what's realistic for your organization. Okay, so that's one of the things that you can do in your organization is to talk to other people about what you really think you can do and what you really have the capacity to do, okay? Um, you also need to look at within your organization to see, you might have a great idea, but who else in your organization is committed to that idea, and who else is willing to help you implement it? So um, let, me, and let me give you an example, okay? So at the commission where I work, we fund state AmeriCorps programs. And I frequently get a phone call from somebody that says, I've heard about AmeriCorps, we would, like an, we would like some AmeriCorps members, okay? And <laughs> wouldn't everybody, because it just you know, seems like a good thing to do without really knowing much about it. And they start to investigate, and they, they investigate a little further, and they still think that they want to do it. And then when I suggest, well, why don't you pull a few people together and let's sit down and talk about it. And when they start to go through their organization, they find out that they really don't have as much support for it as they thought they did that they might be stuck being the one who's going to implement, that they might be stuck being the one that's going to write the grant, that they might be stuck being the one that's going to do all the recruitment. So you need to find out if you've got an idea, if you have anybody <laughs> that sits next to you that supports what your idea is. Okay. You also need to think about what institutional resources you already have that can help you. Um, do you have resources that you could use to match a grant, to look at in-kind, and that means do you have space? 
You can tell somebody, you know, we can do this because we have space. We already pay for it. That's a good thing. That's a resource. Um, you might have people on your staff that have certain kinds of expertise or knowledge, and you can document that in a grant application. So you want to think about that before you even start thinking about writing an application. What kinds of resources do we have in our organization? Why is your organization better suited to ask for what you're asking for than anybody else? Okay, so that means you got to do some comparison shopping. Okay, find out who else in your community does what you do. Why are you better suited? Maybe you're not better suited. Maybe you need to partner with those other organizations and write for one big grant. Okay, so that's that sometimes now for AmeriCorps programs, that's what we do is we'll say, you've got a really little nonprofit and you probably can't manage 10 AmeriCorps members, which is the minimum that we ask people to apply for. But if you partner with five other organizations, Okay, and you, they say, well, we'll give you this much money, we'll kick in this much, and we'll kick in this much, and we'll do the books, and you can do this, and you all kind of go together. You can have one person write the grant, you share amongst you, and then everybody gets a couple members. Okay, that's a really creative way to do it. So a lot of smaller organizations now are able to manage that because they can partner with other people. Another, an example of that here in Grand Rapids is that um, schools of Hope. Anybody heard of Schools of Hope? Okay, Literacy Center um, currently is managing an AmeriCorps grant. They have 10 members. Well, it's going to shift hands a little bit. Next year it's going to the United Way, but they still partner. They're going to get 15 AmeriCorps members, and the hope is to eventually grow it to 25, and then maybe more than that, okay? But because each one of the organizations is contributing something to that, to manage it, they're able to do it. If it was just the literacy center applying by themselves, they wouldn't be able to do it because they just don't have the capacity. But they can do that together, okay? Um, it's ne the next thing that you want to do, once you kind of find out and you think, okay, I've got support within my organization and we know what we want to do and we know that we're best suited and this is what we want to do, the next, then you go to web resources, okay? And it's never been easier you know, when I started out 90 years ago in nonprofit work, <laughs> it was really hard because you had to wait for the Federal Register to come out, or you had to wait for the Council of Michigan Foundation directory to come out to tell you where grants were. Well, now you don't have to worry about that. If you Google grant proposal writing, it turns up 15,700,000 websites. 15 million. Okay, I'm not going to share all those with you today, so you'll be glad. Okay, so now with that in mind, I am going to share some helpful sites because I promised that I would do that. Okay, so the first one is the University of Wisconsin's Grants Information Center. Sorry, I'm kissing this. Um, this particular site is really good. It provides a lot of links to other places. And if you go to it, I, I'm sorry because I don't have, I don't manage it. There are some links that are broken, but there are a lot of links that aren't broken. They have lots and lots of them. This is a really great place to go if you want to learn about grant writing itself. There are lots of tutorials available. Um, and they've got information that's specific if you want to write a general grant or if you want to write a grant to do research. Okay, so there's information for both. But, but the, emphasis, the emphasis here is on instruction. Okay, so it's, um, they also have handbooks. There's a really great handbook that I found that's specifically for nonprofits. And if you go in, it, it will give you an actual proposal or a request for a proposal. And then there's a proposal that was written to go with that request for a proposal. And they have an example if you're, for if you're applying to a public entity. And then they have another example for if you're applying to a private entity. So the commission where I work would be an example of a public entity. We're actually a well-hidden government agency within the Department of Human Services, way buried, way down at the bottom. But we 
administer federal funds. Okay, so we are government. And our RFPs look much different than RFPs that you might get from a small mom and pop foundation. Okay, um, I'm trying to think, like if you were going to apply to the Herrick Foundation in Adrian, okay, very small, and they have different kinds of requirements than we do. We actually give you a set of guidelines that has question by question by question, and you answer the questions. If you answer the questions, it's really pretty hard to screw up, <laughs> which will lead me to the tips I'm gonna talk about later. Um, so the next one is the Grantsmanship Center. They actually will tell you that they're like, that they are the gift to grant writing and that it's the best resource known to man. Um, I don't necessarily think that's true, but it is a really good place. And they offer lots of um, excellent trainings. That's actually, again, about 90 years ago, I was certified by them to write grants. And that's where I got, so I went for, I think it was like 60 hours in one week, and they take you through the whole thing, and you actually come out at the end with a written grant um, that I submitted to the Kellogg Foundation and got funded. So that was worth the training. So they have that. They also have public forums, and they'll have a schedule, and they'll say they're going to be in a different community in a different state, and you can go and you can talk to people and hear what they say about issues that are of concern. Okay. The next one is the National Science Foundation. And you might think, well, why does she have that on there? What has this got to do with us? It's because it's really great. And they are, they know so much cool stuff. And they provide funding that's usually um, education-based, mostly around science, math, engineering, and that kind of thing. So you don't have to apply, but you can go on their site and see their applications and see what they look like. They have all kinds of really great tips for how to write a good proposal. Um, and the people who work there are really cool. So if you call them and say, you know, I, I need some advice if they've got time, but they're kind of neat people to, to talk to. Um, the next one is the Foundation Center. This is probably the one that's most appropriate for all of you, and this is the place that you go if you're looking for nonprofit funding opportunities. Okay, they will have their own, and they will also link you to other sites that have nonprofit um, opportunities. It, they also have good tips on, on writing a proposal. Okay, the next um, couple of them, the USA.gov is kind of a compendium, and if you go there, they have a lot of information about educational grants, those kinds of things. And then the last one is one that I'm intimately involved with, and it's CNS.gov. It's another one of those acronyms, I'm sorry. It stands for the Corporation for National and Community Service. So um, the, the bulk of the money that our organization provides when we have funding opportunities comes from this place. And it's for service-oriented grants. So, you know, what does this have? What you know, what does this have to do with you? If you're here because you're interested in civic engagement, they have resources for civic engagement. Um, they provide funding, the federal funding for all AmeriCorps programs: AmeriCorps State, AmeriCorps National, and Triple C, which is the National Civilian Community Corps, and AmeriCorps Vista. Okay, so you thought AmeriCorps was just AmeriCorps. There are actually four sectors. Okay, they also provide funding for K-12 schools and college and universities. Um, the higher ed piece is really focused on civic engagement, and they provide service learning grants to focus on those. Some of them you apply directly to the corporation itself. Some of them you go through intermediaries here in the state. So for the K-12 stuff, if a school district um, here in um, Kent County wanted to apply for funds to get kids involved in service and volunteerism, mostly service, but connected to the curriculum, you would actually apply to our organization for funding, to the commission. If it's on the higher ed side, usually the funding comes from the Michigan Campus Compact, which is also housed right next door to our office. So um, they will frequently have different kinds of grants 
that you can apply for. And you might be a nonprofit who wants to do something for a college or university. That would still be a really great place for you to look because there may be a way for you to either apply directly for the funds or you could partner with the university and say, hey, we would like to provide this for you. If you guys write a grant and you ask for part of the money for us, we'll give you this back. Okay, so that's, um, so these are neat places to look and you have to go to the websites and kind of, you have to go through them. One of the things I'm gonna tell you is that um, the Kellogg Foundation, which is you know probably the, the biggest one, the biggest money maker here in the state, they get um, around 12,000 applications. Not, you know, they don't send out notices to say we've got a funding opportunity, you just apply to them. And they get any, like around 12,000 applications a year that they have to sort through. So you wanna make sure that if you go to a website, you research it really carefully. Don't just read the top part, but dig deeper to find out what it is that their priorities are and what they're looking for. And don't try to fit a square peg in a round hole. If you don't fit what they do, don't try to fit. Because that's just a lot of extra work for you. You don't want to do that. Let's talk about um, the reasons that, that applications get rejected. Okay. This is this is kind of what I was talking about, that a lot of times people will submit a grant application and they don't do their homework. So you don't have any idea what it is that organization really wants to fund. Okay, most of the places in Michigan, they're pretty friendly and so you can do some research on the web, but then call them. Pick up the phone, call somebody and say, what do you really want to fund right now? And people will talk to you. I get calls every single day from people who say, we have an idea, we would like to get an AmeriCorps program. And then I say, my first question always is, well, what would you want your AmeriCorps members to do? Okay, and then we talk about that. And then we'll get on down the line and we'll talk about money later. But, you know, if it fits with what we're looking at, and fortunately with our organization, we have a lot of priorities. So there's a lot of opportunities for people to fit. But my recommendation is to pick up the phone and call. Okay, have a conversation, say, this is what we're looking at, this is who we are. Um, try to develop a relationship with some of those people. If they don't have funding for you now, they may call you back later and say, guess what, our priorities changed, we got a new pot of money, we think it would really be great to fund you. Okay, so, so that's a good thing, do your homework. Um, some 80% of applications that go to the Kellogg Foundation are rejected because Although the applicant looked at the website, they didn't look at the priorities of the foundation. They just saw Kellogg, 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 you know, saw the dollar signs, and they assumed that they're going to be able to get some money from them, and that's not necessarily true. Um, sometimes there are steps you need to go through in the process, and it's like, well, we just had this really good idea, so we're going to do this application, and we've got to get it in a week now to make the deadline, and you skip over steps. And my recommendation is don't skip over steps. Things like math errors. You know, somebody didn't have somebody take the time to go back and double check the math in your application. Um, if, depending on who the funder is, they might just throw it out. You know, most of the time, if it's math errors for us, if the program part looks really good, we'll sit down with you and we'll get out a calculator and we'll figure it out together. But Big, big funders, big private funders won't take that time to do that. So you need to make sure that you go through. Um, sometimes people omit names. They'll have like a cover page and you get a grant and it's like, wait a minute, this is a really good application, but I don't know who wrote it. <laughs> you know, who do I call to ask more questions? Who do I talk to to clarify? Um, that's that's kind of scary, but we've I've had people do that frequently or they'll leave a phone number off or an email. They don't send an email address and that's not a, not real useful. Okay. Um, sometimes organizations will submit an application to more than one person within an organization. So like again with somebody the size of Kellogg you might say well I know this person in this department and I know there's somebody in another department and I'm going to send this application to both of them. And that's the probably the 
what will end up happening is that it'll just get thrown. It'll get pitched someplace. Because one person will say to the other person, well, I have it, I'm going to look at it. And the other person will say, I have it, I'm going to look at that. We did, um, one time they actually asked an organization that I was the director of to submit an application to them. They called us and said, we, we have money, we know what you do, we want you to ask us for money. And that was kind of exciting. But we had to go through all these steps, and we submitted it, and then we didn't hear anything from them. Well, I knew, we, I actually had a gal who was a secretary there who was on my board of directors, and I said, can you find anything out? So she went from desk to desk, looking through piles, looking for our grant application. And she found it, and she said, well, it's gone through this tax review. We know that that means it's probably going to get funded, that they want to fund it. Well, it disappeared. And a year later, they contacted us and said, you know what? We lost your grant. And we want you to start all over again. So you want to make sure that you're sending it to the right person. <laughs> and I would make sure that you do make that contact so that you can say, you know, is, is this the last place that it needs to be? Is this who I'm sending it to? Lynn? That's right. That's a great tip. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah. With, with our applications, um, when we do something, the very first, we actually let you go through kind of two rounds. So we ask you to submit an application. You submit it in hard copy. It gets reviewed. And then when it gets tweaked and it's the very best it can be, then we say, OK, looks really great now. Put it online. You know, Plug it into this online system so that you don't have to keep cutting and pasting back and forth. Um, so online is really good. A lot of people don't proofread. That's another reason that things don't get through. It's amazing how many people will um, write a grant and not, maybe even two people sit down together and they write it, but they never have somebody look at it. You have to have somebody look at it who doesn't know anything about what you do. Okay, You know, give it to a spouse. Give it to... If you have an older kid, give it to them so that they can read it and they can say, okay, I understand this. This makes sense. Okay, um, They don't have to be a grant reviewer. They just need to be able to read it and make sense of it. And if they can make sense of it, then a grant reviewer will be able to do that too. Um, another thing is overused jargon. So I was talking about acronyms. Um, and sometimes funders are the worst. But... We actually had an application from somebody, and we give you a page limit. So you've got to answer all the questions, but you've got to do in a page limit. And we got the application back after it had been reviewed one time, got the application back a second time, and so that they could answer more questions, they abbreviated everything. The word program, the word department, the, I mean, I can't even tell you, everything was abbreviated. And I was, I was lost by the time I got to the third page. I couldn't remember. I mean, the first time I read it, I thought, OK, that's probably what this means. But by the time I got to page three, I completely forgot what I thought it was on, <laughs> on the previous page. And the reason they did it was because you know, we, people ask for a lot, and you only have a certain amount of space to put it in. Okay. And it, it becomes a real talent to be able to say things very succinctly and get as much across in a short amount of space as possible. So one of the things, if we were going to be here longer, what I would do is I would give you a section from a grant application that's kind of long-winded and have you work in a twosome or a threesome and pare it down. You know, say the same thing to me, but say it in a couple of paragraphs. And you'd be amazed. At how, you would all be able to do it. You absolutely would all be able to do it. But when people sit down and they're writing a grant, they're so worried about getting that money that they just they say all kinds of extra stuff that doesn't need to be there. You don't have to put adjectives in to describe things. You don't have to use a lot of adverbs. Okay, it's not it's not creative writing class. On the other hand, you do want to paint a picture of what it is you're going to do so that the person, if you're writing something to Washington and they're not familiar with Michigan, you want to be able to paint a picture of where this is going to happen. So like when we get grants from the UP 
and some of them come to us and then we send them to Washington to be reviewed, we have to make sure that those people in Washington, D.C. know what the UP is, okay? And you have to write out Upper Peninsula because UP is not a known term anywhere else in this country. They look at it and even though there's periods there, they still say up, you know? <laughs> We're providing money to the up? What is that? I don't know. Um, it's important, there are times when you have to use an acronym because it's really all there is, and if you do, you need to make sure that you define it. Also, if you are working around a certain issue, and you know what your issue is. So for example, so at the office, um, I used to manage the service learning pool of money for six and a half years. Well, you start talking about civic engagement and ser academic service learning and all of these kind of things and people who aren't in education haven't got a clue as to what the heck I'm talking about. Okay, so you have to be really good at defining what those kinds of things are. Okay, what do winning proposals have? Okay, this seems kind of common sense um, but the important thing is when you look at all of these things that they tie together. So you have to have clearly defined needs and describe how you identify those needs. The, one of the best things in really great applications for money is to show that you met with a bunch of people to decide to do this. So let me give you an example. We fund a program that's called the Campaign to End Homelessness. Okay, one of the cool things is when they applied, they had actually gotten a group of homeless recipients together to talk about what it is they need. Okay, they, they got input from the people who are gonna get the service. And if you can gather homeless people around a table to talk about money, you can probably get everybody <laughs> around the table to talk about money. So, so getting your target audience, getting the people together, you know, any, here's another jargony term, stakeholders. If you talk about who, stakeholders in any other field in the world, they wouldn't know who stakeholders are. But they're people who have a stake in whatever it is that you're, you're going to do, the service that you're going to provide. So if you can get people around the table, funders don't want to see that your organization came up with a great idea and deci you decided this was the need in the community and you decided that this is what you're going to do to meet that need. They want to see that a whole bunch of you talked and decided that, wow, this would be really good, and your organization is definitely best suited to do that. Then you have to take go from the need to describing how you're going to actually address that need. So do you have an approach? One of the things we just added last year, because people weren't automatically doing it, was do you have any sense that the approach you're going to take will work? Did you just make it up? You know, was this a dream that you had or did you think about it when you were in the bathroom taking a shower? That's usually where I come up with my ideas. So I think if I put in a grant application, well, I thought about it while I was in the shower. It makes sense to me that it'll work, okay? Some people wouldn't agree with that though. Now, my teammates would, because they know if I head down the hall to the bathroom, I'm going to come back with a good idea. <laughs> um, anyway, that was more personal than you really wanted to know. But, but we specifically say, okay, you identify a need in your community. It's compelling. Um, it's pretty easy to do that in Michigan these days. We've got lots of compelling needs, things that are really basic that people need. Then you say, this is the approach that we're going to use. And it's, you know, it's a creative idea. We want to take a chance. We want to try this. Um, we've, you know, seen it work in other states, this is what we think, you know, hypothetically, or you could have actually seen a successful program and know that it will work. Maybe there's some evaluation, maybe there's some research behind it. So you want to say, this is the approach we're going to take and we know it's going to work because we have evidence that shows, you know, blah, blah, blah. Then you actually have to break it down into bite-sized pieces. You have to talk about what the activities are. Okay, so this is the approach, but these are kind of the day-to-day -day things that we're going to do and when somebody looks at those activities, they have to look back at your need and say, hey, yeah, that makes sense. Those match, okay? And a lot of times, um, people will write grants and the activities don't match. You can't make a connection. It's just a complete leap. The other thing you need to do is to make sure that your material is in a logical manner. 
So with our applications, we actually set it up for you. We give you headers. And it's amazing how many times people won't use the headers. We even have a thing, a template on our website that has the headers there. So all you have to do is then dump your narrative into it. You don't even have to retype them. You can just put it in there. And they'll still send us something that doesn't have the headers on it. And we're like, hmm, I wonder where one section starts and the next one begins or you know stops and begins, whatever. So you need to make sure that, and if they don't give you headers, Create your own. I mean, make, make something there so that people can see where, where things are flowing. OK? Um, if you're writing uh, a proposal that has more than one need, so let's say um, you're talking about affordable housing and foreclosure prevention, OK? Two, two kind of, they go together nicely, but they're two totally different needs. You want to make sure that you have objectives, things you want to reach. For those, you want to make sure that you have, um, I just got the five minute. You want to make sure you have activities for each one, and you also want to make sure that you evaluate each one, OK? The next thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you write in positive terms. This is really difficult in Michigan right now. A lot of times people think, well, if I write about how bleak it is here, and you know how devastated the whole state is. We'll just get money. They'll throw it at us to fix it because we're in such you know we're in such bad condition. But you really need to be. If it's it's one thing to say we have a compelling need. It's another just to say it's so bad you just need to give us money. You need to be able to demonstrate that there's something that you're actually going to do to address those things. Your budgets need to match the proposed program. Um, funders like to see that you can leverage other money. So if you can demonstrate that by getting the money you're asking for, you'll be able to get some more money someplace else, that's a good thing. Readers want to see something given back. They want to see that you have something that's replicable. If we do this, we're going to create a product you can use. We're going to create a model that somebody else can, can follow, whatever. You want to use the weight of the sections of the application to help you determine the number of pages you want to focus on. So when we have an application, you get more points for a section on the design of your program than you do for the capacity of your organization. Okay? And you want to, or, or vice versa. You know, whatever that is, you want to make sure that you spend the right amount of space. Okay? The next thing is how do you get funded? Okay, I've already kind of talked about this, but you want to follow the required format, whatever their format is. So you might be used to writing a grant application one way, but if you contact us and you decide you want to write it the way you wrote another grant, you have to write it our way, okay? You can't cut and paste from an old application to fit a new application. People will be able to see that. You need to make sure that um, you have consistent writing style. So that means that if you've got five people that each say, I'm going to write a different section, you've got to have one person take all that and put it together so it sounds like it's in one voice. Because otherwise, it reads funny. Um, and reviewers, you know, they just have a bad feeling about that. So I either have one person write it or have somebody pull it all together after everybody's written the sections. Um, and I already mentioned this, too. Ask somebody who's not familiar with your project to assess your proposal. Okay? Now, before I was going to say let's practice, but the priorities currently, um, one of the things we just did here in um, Grand Rapids, and we did this in nine other cities, we did a listening tour so that we could kind of find out what some of the priorities are. So, for example, we have, um, if we get, we've applied for volunteer generation money. And if we get it, we're going to fund 10 communities. We're going to fund volunteer connector organizations. They're, we're asking them to pull together five agencies in a community that focus on a particular need, pull them together to the table. The volunteer connector will get the funding, but be able to bring those five agencies together to mobilize volunteers around two issues. The first one is health. And when I say health, and that's definitely a priority across the country right now. I'm not talking just, you know, like medical health. I'm talking about things like um, 
nutrition, exercise, healthy eating. Have you seen the billboards going up all over the place that have to do with farmers markets lately? Okay, you can see people trying to, you know, it's kind of a new, a new buzz, a new, a new fad, but it's also really important. Um, the, the, I was trying to think, what it, there's an organization that's actually coming into our office this afternoon to meet, but, but there's going to be a food core, C-O-R-P-S, in the state of Michigan and across the country. There are going to be people who are actually focused on access to healthy foods. And, you know, Detroit, um, Ford, the Ford Fund has actually invested in having mobile units that are available to take fresh produce to different communities, different neighborhoods that have not had access. People can't get out. All they've got is party stores on the corner, and they're not getting that kind of stuff. So that's been a, that's been a huge thing. A second thing in Michigan is public safety. Um, cities of service are looking at that. So Grand Rapids and Detroit primarily are looking at issues around how to make your neighborhood safer. You know, putting money into things like making sure there's adequate lighting. Um, it could be helping older adults to make sure that they have safety plans. And, you know, could be getting out of their homes if there's a fire. So it can be all kinds of different things. But so health, public safety, those are two big things. Um, clean energy is a third one. That's a, it's a huge priority across the country. Um, and weatherization kind of goes along with that. Those are two things that are being looked at. Um, literacy continues to be a big um, issue, that a big priority for people across the country. Um, adult literacy and ch childhood literacy. One of the good things is that Grand Rapids has done a great job so far following that movement and looking at English as a second language and helping, um, helping adults who... Um, English is not their primary language, learning how to read. Um, so those are probably, in terms of priorities, those are the biggest ones. Um, if you are an organization that promotes volunteerism, then you want to be able to get your volunteers to help around those issues. And if you want to get funding for some of the things you do, if you can get your volunteers out in the community to help promote safety, promote health, promote clean energy, all of those kinds of things, that's a, that's a good thing. Let me show you one more slide, actually two more things. We were gonna, I've got handouts up here that you can take that will help you to do some practicing. Um, so if you want them, you can take them. If you don't want, because we're gonna, I'm gonna wrap up here in just a second. When you leave, you can come up and get them. One helps you to figure out um, what the need is and where the gaps are in your community. Another one helps you look at evaluation and another one that I think is really good is, is looking at the cost and how to determine the cost and the benefit. Okay, These are some civic engagement resources. Um, they're in your handout as well. The Corporation for National and Community Service, I talked about that already. CIRCLE, the Center for Civic Education. The most important one is the very last one, the Center for um, Democracy and Citizenship. I think that's a great resource, and a lot of times they can link you to money for civic engagement projects. This is my contact information. It's in your handout. So if you ever have an idea about a grant you want to write, you can call me. If you have a grant you've written and you want somebody to approve it before you send it, call me. Um, and I'm not the only one there. We have other people at my office that we just like to do that on the side. We'd be happy to help you. Um, I helped look at a VISTA application for somebody here in town. Um, just extra, extra eyes. If you're interested in service learning funding, AmeriCorps funding, mentoring funding, volunteer funding, um, that's, you know, we're, we're one of the places that you can go to, to contact. So that's the, all the time we have. Okay. <laughs> Anybody have any parting questions? Yes. Mm-hmm. 
we don't just wait reading those grants, but get a real good mm -hmm. sense of what what is a good grant application. Mm -hmm. Being on the other side of it, completely different experience. I'm glad you mentioned that. We have grant reviews uh, all through the fall and winter every year. And we're always looking for grant reviewers. And so if you're interested in, be, in reviewing a grant at some point in time, you never get more than five to look at. You do have to come to Lansing for one day, um, and we feed you. Um, so if you're interested, again, you can just email me and say, next time you have a grant review, I'd love to review a grant for you. And that's a great idea, Eric. Thank you very much. Any other questions before you depart to your? Okay, thank you, and if you want stuff up here, help yourself. Thank you, thank you.